Uh, as Jonas just mentioned, this, I was stepping in on very last moments. Therefore, I will take a sort of very different um, approach to providing this summary, which has a surplus that it will be very short. Um, therefore, um, what I will do, obviously, first of all, this presentation does not at all call for completeness. Please don't feel uh, uneasy uh, if I don't cover your favorite subject. I will focus on topics, not on talks. And here, since this uh, conference has the ambitious title of the big next steps, I just pick those uh, topics which I regard as the most pressing ones at, at present. But clearly, such a thing is very subjective, right? Therefore, this is my personal takeaway from this. Um, a conference that you might or might not share. Maybe we have a little discussion time uh, afterwards to see if there are points to be added. Having presented that disclaimer, let me right dive into the topics. Well, I, obviously I cannot uh, avoid mentioning my favorite one. That's the nature of exotics. We had its intense discussions and talks on the crucial quantities that are to be measured in order to understand the role of molecules in the spectrum. And what emerged from the discussions, which is something that wasn't uh, really so prominently known before, at least not to me, is that the effective range, which is one of the uh, parameters uh, characterizing elastic scattering, um, is a very important quantity to determine whether or not there is a molecular contribution to a given state. Such an effective range could either be determined from uh, lattice QCD, we had a very nice talk on that by Joe Dudek, or by experiment. Although the experimental determination has a catch that so we'll come to uh, in a second. Well, the discussion revealed that for uh, effective ranges larger than zero, unambiguously, the structure we are looking at must be a hydronic molecule. An example for a state like this is the deuteron, which has an, eff uh, an effective range of the order of the pion mass, which is positive. If the effective range is negative, however, there are two possible interpretations. The one that was pushed by, for instance, uh, Luciano Maiani in his talk is that this immediately shows that there must be a compact component. But I personally do not agree because uh, couple channel effects are also immediately and unavoidably, because the sign is fixed by unitarity, also introduce, in, introduce a, la, a negative scattering links that can well be large, uh, sorry, effective range, that can well be large and negative, uh, large in, in uh, magnitude, but negative, if the, couple, uh, the uh, channel that couples in, couples in strongly. An example of that, actually we had two examples of that kind, uh, namely the um, KC1, C872, and the TCC. In both cases, the states are located very close to a, a scattering threshold, but there is a second threshold nearby that is necessarily relevant for the formation of the state if both states are indeed isoscalar. And this, the effect on the effective range from that second channel uh, gives a sizable negative effective range. This is a discussion that's still going on, but I hope that will be settled. I put here an additional warning that was not discussed, but one shouldn't overlook. If one wants to extract the effective range from scattering experiments, uh, sorry, from production experiments, not from scattering, one should be aware that the energy dependence of the amplitude is not um, exactly given by the energy dependence of the T matrix because unitarity fixes the production amplitude only up to a polynomial. Therefore, there can be an additional energy dependence in the production vertex that one can easily uh, misinterpret as a contribution to the effective range. That's an issue that still needs to be discussed in more depth eventually. Clearly, this problem does not emerge if the effective range is extracted from lattice QCD. And one should also not forget that QCD can provide, uh, for instance, phase shifts that uh, one cannot get access to an experiment, which is great. But to understand the physical content of the lattice data, one still needs an additional machinery um, in the same way as from phase shifts extracted in experiment. We need additional machinery to access the nature of a given state. 
What we've also discussed somewhat is that line shapes also encode a lot of interesting information, uh, which a statement some, that somewhat overlaps with the first statement. What is needed to make progress here? Well, what became clear from the discussions is that, for instance, if you want to get more information on the KIC 13872, we should, one should really do combined analyses of the most prominent channels like Pi Pi J Psi, DD star in the neutral channel, and even channels like this, which are known to couple to the X as well, in order to really pin down the resonance parameters and ambiguously. In Tomas's talk, it became clear that there, there was in the parametrization an additional hidden width that one could not determine without really directly fitting to all those couple channels. And then another thing that would be very cool to have would be high resolution direct line shape measurements because those can also uh, get direct access to the molecular nature. Topic two, amplitude analysis. What became clear from various talks, now this is overlapping to the, uh, also to the presentation by Claudia, uh, but I cannot resist to state it again, bright Wigner analysis are to be taken with care. First of all, a single, a single bright Wigner is well behaved as soon as you have sums of bright weakness, you immediately violate unitarity. Unavoidably, this can also not be repaired by just putting in complex phases in the vertices. And parameters are reaction dependent. And that this actually is a very important and striking thing and very easily leads to wrong interpretations became, for instance, clear in uh, Bertram Koff's talk, because uh, he showed that, for instance, uh, in confirming a JPEG analysis that there's only one exotic pi one needed and not two, so the 1600 is not needed as soon as one does a proper amplitude analysis and not just uses bright weakness. Um, this also illustrates very nicely that bright weakness parameters are reaction dependent. They cannot be pulled from one reaction to the other so easily. This very easily leads to misinterpretations. Therefore, what is needed in general for amplitude analyses, these are formalisms that are consistent with most of all unitarity and amplicity. That's something that, for instance, the K-matrix nicely do, does. But there is more to QCD. QCD has an approximate chiral symmetry. We, we know how chiral symmetry is broken in QCD. However, this should be implemented in the analyses if necessary. We had a discussion on that in Joe Dudek's talk that maybe at 390 MeV pion masses, it's not such, such a crucial issue. But if one really wants to do the chiral extrapolation to the threshold, this will be crucial. It would be good to have parametrizations that are consistent with the low energy phase shifts because those are uh, very well known, especially for the S waves, and they're highly non trivial for the S waves. So, for simple um, K matrix um, parametrizations for S wave scattering, have a hard time to get the low energy S wave phase shifts right. And what popped up in various discussions that was in, for instance, in, uh, in Annika's talk on the uh, some baryon decay, but also a lot in the discussions about the uh, dibaryons. There are also possible uh, roles of triangle singularities. Um, there's something that I don't have on my slide, but it should not remain unmentioned. Uh, Claudia showed that there are a lot of exotics seen in the uh, uh, B going to J Psi Phi K data from LHCB, but there's the paper by um, Satoshi Nakamura, who explains the full spectrum just with triangle singularities. So it's certainly not the last word on that reaction because uh, he just fits the, um, the uh, J Psi uh, Phi uh, spectrum and not the other one simultaneously. And there's a lot of um, K, K star um, physics going on. This just shows how uh, non-trivial line shapes can be to use by triangle singularities. So those guys will play an increasingly important role in future analysis, I'm sure. And clearly, all those things apply also to the analysis of lattice data. For instance, when it comes to the determination of the location of the lowest pole in the um, uh, scalar D meson channel, the D0, which in the PDG is, is dubbed uh, D0-2300, if one wants to extract that pole location 
for near physical pion masses from the data, especially chiral symmetry constraints, I think are very important to get reliable results out and maybe even SU3 things, uh, SU3 relations if one really wants to get at the multi plane. Okay. The final thing I would like to mention is uh, the discussion on the G minus two, although this was only a minor part in this conference, I think it's a major part in uh, modern physics. And what became clear is that the most pressing issue to establish or uh, uh, falsify the current discrepancy between standard model and the data is that the lattice systematics needs to be understood. This became especially clear in the uh, afternoon discussions we had that it's not clear if the lattice study, especially from the VAW group, really includes all the uh, systematic uncertainties and how reliable it actually is. An important thing to mention in that context is that there's not much freedom in the uh, to modify the phenological or dispersion theoretical side of the calculation. Therefore, so if indeed this BNW calculation for the G minus two hadronic contribution uh, persists to be correct, then something major must would mean to go wrong here. And we have no clue at the moment what that could be, but maybe this will be very educated to, to understand that discrepancy once this issue here is thought out. That's all I wanted to say from this, from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, to Christoph. Um, are there any questions directly to Christoph's talk? Uh, Yes, Sarah. Uh, Hi, Christoph. Thank you very much for uh, for, for for the summer. It's uh, it's very nice. Only I, I like to make a comment on the on the second slide, if you don't mind. No, I don't mind. Sure not. <laughs> yeah. How could I? <laughs> Yeah, that's good. No, is that um, is that the second or is that the second? Depending on no, how the previous think. one, the number two. Sorry, ah, okay. it's it's your number two. Okay, perfect. I mean, I'm very strict with numbering. <laughs> so yeah, I, I just want to comment um, in this picture that you are showing of the of the effective range. I I just feel that uh, the concept of virtual state is missing which we know they do exist. I don't know if you are incorporating them in, within the concept of hadronic molecule or, because we know com virtual states exist because we know it from proton neutron, uh, it's called, so, for, even the, the di neutron. So it's, so are you incorporating that concept inside the hadronic molecule? Because if they are not, I mean, this picture is, is more messier than just R bigger than zero and R smaller than zero. That is actually what you are, in practice saying because of the couple challenge effect. Mm -hmm. So it's, that's, that's my comment only. Come to virtual states is, is somewhat tricky, but uh, we've recently published a paper, I think it appeared last year, where it is indeed we extended by analytic continuation, the um, Weinberg criteria, I talked about that in my talk, as Weinberg criterion also to virtual states and the picture basically persists. Therefore, I would ex we, is there, we haven't looked at the range corrections. Therefore, this is really strictly within the Weinberg approach, where the um, effective range can only be negative, because the positive effective range then comes from the range corrections that are explicitly neglected in the Weinberg approach. But you can de demonstrate that virtual states, beyond doubt, are always of molecular nature. A compact state does not generate a virtual state. And this you can show by straightforward analytic continuation of the results of Weinberg. Very good. Thank you, Christoph. You're welcome. So as you uh, might have seen on the agenda, there is now a one minute break, uh, theoretically, for champagne. Uh, and then we go to the general discussion. So we do that straight away. Um, uh, I'm sure you've all already found your own champagne glass and bottle. And um, I hand over to Bitlab to, uh, to chair the discussion of the workshop summary in general. So that refers to these talks and to basically anything you want to discuss. Well, good luck.